Welcome to Heart of Texas Histories and Mysteries. I'm your host, M, coming to you from deep in the heart of Texas. In this episode, I'll be telling you about a terrifying period in the history of Texas's capital city. In the 1880s, Austin had a serial killer on the loose, the first known serial killer in the United States. The horrific acts of this perpetrator predated those of London's Jack the Ripper. There are even some people who think he was the same person as Jack the Ripper, but the truth is, we'll never know for sure. The Austin killer has never been identified, and although not all of his victims were servant girls, he is known to this day as the Servant Girl Annihilator. Let's get into it. of 1884, Austin was thriving. In 1860, it had only been home to about 5,000 people. The city's population was now estimated to be 15,000. The Texas Capitol building was under construction, set to be even taller than the United States Capitol building. Businesses were moving out of wooden buildings and into brick-and-mortar ones. Residents and visitors could take a ride on the streetcar, attend a show at the opera, dine at fine restaurants, and even enjoy a treat at an ice cream parlor that boasted an early form of air conditioning. Stately new homes were popping up along what were then the far reaches of town, home to three institutions of higher education— the University of Texas, St. Edwards College, and the Tillotson Collegiate and Normal Institute, Austin had become known as the Athens of the West. All in all, post-Civil War, post-Reconstruction Austin was a city on the rise. Generally speaking, it was also a city with a low rate of violent crime. While Austin certainly had its barroom fights that ended with shots being fired, and while the occasional crime of passion did occur in the city, random violence was practically unheard of. But sadly, that was about to change. On the night of December 29, 1884, or perhaps in the early morning hours of December 30th, a young man named Walter Spencer stumbled into the main part of the Walter Hall residence at 901 West Pecan Street, or 6th Street. He had several visible head wounds and had come in to summon the help of Tom Chalmers, a relative of the homeowner. Walter frantically expressed that somebody had nearly killed him and that Molly was gone. Molly was Walter Spencer's girlfriend, 25-year-old Molly Smith, who had been working as a cook at the Hall residence for only a month. She and Walter occupied an apartment at the back of the house. The next morning, a servant of the Hall family's neighbors came upon a gruesome sight. Molly's body was lying in the snow behind the Hall's outhouse. She had a gaping wound on the side of her head. When police arrived, they determined that Molly had been attacked in her own bedroom and then dragged outside. In her room, they discovered that the furniture was out of place and found broken glass on the floor. They also found bloody marks that appeared to be from someone's fingers, as well as a bloody axe, almost undoubtedly the murder weapon. The police quickly ruled out Walter Spencer as a suspect, as by all accounts he and Molly had a good relationship and, besides, he himself had been wounded. They instead set their sights on William Brooks, who had once been Molly's boyfriend in Waco and was now bartending at the Barrel House Saloon on East Pecan Street. They thought that he could have been jealous of Molly's new relationship with Walter. William swore that he had been at a ball at the time of the murder. Ultimately, he was not tried for Molly's death. There were a number of additional attacks on servant girls in Austin the following spring that did not result in any fatalities. Several of these attacks involved home invasions and demands for money. 
In one case, two Swedish girls who were working in the household of Colonel J.H. Pope at Guadalupe Street and College Avenue or 12th Street reported that they heard a knock at the door before someone shot through the window. One girl was hit in the shoulder while a bullet grazed the neck of the other. Unfortunately, 30-year-old Eliza Shelley was one Austin servant who would not live to tell her tale. Like Molly Smith, Eliza worked as a cook. In May 1885, she was employed in the household of Dr. Lucian B. Johnson, whose home was located near the intersection of San Jacinto Street and Cypress Street or 3rd Street. Eliza, who lived with her three children in a cabin behind the main house, was found deceased in her bedroom with a large wound above her right eye, a wound between her eyes, and a wound above one of her ears that was more like a hole. In this case, there was no weapon to be found. Her eight-year-old son told police that a man had entered the cabin demanding money, but he could only recall that the man had had a white rag covering his face. Police did find the print from a bare foot outside in the dirt. When they saw 19-year-old Andrew Williams walking barefoot in the area later the same day, they arrested him immediately. They also arrested 30-year-old Ike Plummer soon after Eliza was killed. He was an acquaintance of Eliza's, whom witnesses claimed had been harassing Eliza for money and carrying a hatchet or a hammer in his pocket. But neither of these men ever went to trial for Eliza's murder. Three weeks after Eliza was killed, Irene Cross was found screaming in the street, badly wounded. Irene was the servant of Sophia Whitman, who lived at 302 East Linden Street or 17th Street, near Schultz's Beer Garden. She, too, had been attacked in her sleep. An artery in her arm had been severed, and she had nearly been scalped. Irene sadly died from her injuries the next day. According to some sources, Irene had a son, who told police that he had seen the attacker and described him as a large man who was barefooted, had his pants rolled up, and was carrying a pocket knife. The unknown murderer had previously been called the Austin Axe Murderer, but it was somewhere around this time that author William Sidney Porter, better known as O. Henry, gave the assailant a new moniker. He wrote to a friend, Town is fearfully dull, except for the frequent raids of the servant girl annihilators, who make things lively during the dead of night. While O. Henry's statement indicates that he believed there was more than one killer, the similarities between the killings led others to conclude that they were the acts of a single perpetrator. Journalists and the public at large began calling this mysterious individual the Servant Girl Annihilator. Another string of crimes broke out that summer, with servant girls continuing to be the targets. Some servant girls were victims of break-ins that resulted in jewelry being stolen, while others reported rocks being thrown at their windows and others even reported being shot at. Residents of Austin, who were more on edge every day, demanded that the police do something about the sudden and horrifying increase in crime within the city. Grooms Lee, the city marshal, insisted that the Austin police and the city of Austin were doing everything possible, but he conceded that with the police force being as small as it was, there was only so much that could be done. In August 1885, more unspeakable acts of violence occurred. This time, a child became a victim. Early on a Sunday morning, Mary Ramey, who was only 11 years old, was taken from her bed at 300 East Cedar Street or 4th Street and dragged into a wash house. She was found bleeding out in the backyard of Valentine O. Weed, her mother Rebecca's employer. Mary had been violated and an iron pin had been forced into both of her ears and driven into her brain. Mary sadly did not survive long after being discovered. 
Rebecca herself had been attacked with a sandbag and received at least one blow to the head with a sharp object. She survived, but it appears that she was unable to supply any details about the attacker. However, police did find one clue, the print from a bare foot that was missing a pinky toe. They arrested a man named Tom Allen after search dogs picked up his scent and followed it to a nearby stable, but later determined that he could not have committed the crimes and released him. Although a young man named Alex Mack was also rumored to be the attacker, he did not get arrested at this time. Austin was still reeling from the murder of young Mary Ramey when the killer struck again. 20-year-old Gracie Vance and her boyfriend, 25-year-old Orange Washington, lived in a cabin in the backyard of William B. Dunham at 2408 Guadalupe Street. Some records show the address as 2408 San Marcos Street, but in any event, we know that the Dunham House was close to the original main building on the University of Texas campus. One night in late September, Gracie and Orange were hosting two friends, Lucinda Body and Patsy Gibson. Sometime in the middle of the night, William Dunham awoke to the sound of what he thought was someone being slapped. He stepped out briefly to investigate, but, hearing no further sounds at that time, went back to bed. But he awoke again a while later to the sounds of someone jumping through the cabin's window and a woman screaming. He ran outside with his gun and found Lucinda Body in a struggle with a man whom he could not recognize in the dark. Lucinda was able to break free, but so was her attacker. Lucinda ran to Mr. Dunham and grabbed him in panic, preventing him from being able to shoot at the suspect. Men from neighboring houses ran out and shot at the fleeing assailant, but were unable to hit him as he disappeared into the night. He had left a horse tied up on the street, which was later determined to have been stolen. According to this version of events, Lucinda Body suffered minor injuries, although other sources say that her injuries were very severe. Patsy Gibson was found in the cabin, wounded, but she would survive the attack. Orange Washington was not so fortunate. He was found on the floor, barely breathing and with his head nearly split in half. He passed away not long afterward. William Dunham said that he found a bloody axe in the bed, and that neither he nor anyone else who lived on his property owned an axe. The body of Gracie Vance was discovered outside. She had been dragged out of the cabin and over a fence before being violated and beaten to death with a rock. Lucinda told police that the perpetrator was Doc Woods, an acquaintance of Gracie Vance's and likely also an acquaintance of Orange Washington's. He had apparently asked to come into the cabin earlier, but Gracie had turned him away. Lucinda said that she recognized him when she awoke from being hit and lit a lamp, and that she pleaded with him, Oh, Doc, don't do it, as he began attacking the other victims. She stated that his response was, Don't look at me. Blow out that light. William Dunham also told authorities that he recognized Doc Woods as someone who had previously visited Gracie's cabin. An Austinite named Johnson Trigg reported that he had seen Doc Woods and another man, Oliver Townsend, downtown and that he had heard them discussing when they would kill Gracie. He also said that he had heard them talking about killing Rebecca Ramey before she and her daughter Mary were attacked. Doc Woods, who had been seen wearing a bloody shirt, and Oliver Townsend were arrested. But like so many others suspected in this series of crimes, neither was ever prosecuted. Johnson Trigg, however, was sentenced to five years for perjury. As September turned into October, the city of Austin authorized the mayor to hire detectives to assist in solving the series of violent attacks. Alex Mack's name came up again when he was involved in an altercation at the Black Elephant Saloon. 
Alex Mack stated that City Marshal Grooms Lee, along with other officers, used excessive force when they arrested him. Lee was questioned about this but denied Mack's allegations and also insisted that he had long believed Mack was involved in the attack on Rebecca and Mary Ramey. Alex Mack was jailed for a little over a week before being released. Sometime in November, police refocused their attention on Walter Spencer and arrested him for the murder of Molly Smith, but he was soon exonerated. The hunt for the servant girl annihilator continued as the Christmas season approached. Male citizens of Austin were arming themselves and performing their own night patrols of the city. A new city marshal, James Lucy, replaced Grooms Lee, and the police force was expanded. The city also issued a midnight curfew. But despite these efforts, another pair of murders would soon occur. These two murders were carried out in a similar manner to the other six that had taken place in Austin over the last year. But the killer diverged from his usual pattern in one way. While all of the previous murder victims had been black, in these cases, the victims were white. On Christmas Eve 1885, a mechanic named Moses Hancock awoke with the strange feeling that someone had entered his residence at 203 East Water Street, or 1st Street, uninvited. His daughters had gone to a Christmas party, and he and his wife, Susan, had left the doors unlocked in anticipation of the girls returning home very late. Susan had gone to sleep in one of their daughters' rooms. When Moses went to check on her, he didn't see her, but he did see blood. Moses soon found Susan in the backyard, moaning in agony. He would later state that he saw two men jump the fence and disappear into the night. Susan had a fractured skull, had been violated, and was bleeding heavily from her ears. Moses summoned the help of a neighbor, and the two men rushed to carry Susan inside. Although several doctors quickly arrived at the house, they were unable to save her. Police later found a bloody axe on the property. That same night, not long after Susan was found, more horror unfolded at the Phillips residence at 302 West Hickory Street or 8th Street. Sophia Phillips awoke to the sound of her son, James Jr., yelling for help. He had been attacked in his sleep and had a deep wound on the side of his head. There was an axe next to the heavily bloodied bed. James's baby son, Thomas, was in the room, unharmed. But his wife, 17-year-old Eula, was missing. Sophia followed a trail of ominous red footprints to the backyard. There she discovered her daughter-in-law lying deceased in a pool of blood. Eula had been attacked with a blunt object and violated. Her killer had placed wooden boards across her body to hold her down. When the time came to prepare Eula's body for burial, Sophia Phillips turned to Sally Mack, a laundress who lived nearby, for help. Sally Mack had been born in Virginia, presumably as a slave, and had by this point been living in Texas for decades. Known for her compassion and kindness, she was a beloved figure in the Austin community and was affectionately known as Aunt Sally. Two years earlier, Sally and Sophia had both come outside when they heard the cries of an infant. Together, they had discovered an abandoned baby girl lying in the grass. Sally had cared for the child until she was adopted. Now, Sally and Sophia would soon have another experience in common. Like Sally Mack's son, Alex, Sophia Phillips's son, James, would find himself accused of murder. Although James was badly wounded himself on that fateful Christmas Eve, the authorities could not ignore the unstable and dramatic relationship he had had with his wife, Eula. James was said to be a hot-tempered, heavy drinker who had constantly questioned Eula's fidelity, and it was rumored that he had been abusive toward her. 
At the time of her murder, Eula had only recently returned to Austin to live with James and his parents. She had left James in November, taking baby Thomas with her. It was said that she had first gone to stay at the home of a woman named Fanny Whipple, where she met with a man named John Dickinson multiple times. John Dickinson was secretary of the Capitol Commission, which was the agency responsible for overseeing the construction of the new state Capitol building. After staying at Ms. Whipple's for a week, Eula moved on to the home of May Tobin. Like Ms. Whipple, Ms. Tobin was known around Austin for renting out rooms to people who wished to have extramarital encounters. Eula allegedly met with John Dickinson at her home as well. But after a week or so, Eula again packed her bags and headed to Manchac and Elgin to stay with relatives. According to James' parents, he worked hard on improving himself during the time Eula was away. Mr. and Mrs. Phillips said that he stopped drinking and got a job as a carpenter. In early December, James enlisted the help of one of his sisters and headed off for Elgin to convince Eula to come home with him. Eula agreed, and from the outside looking in, it seemed that life was finally becoming more peaceful for the couple. But it turned out that Eula snuck away from the Phillips house on the night of December 24th, 1885, and reappeared at the door of May Tobin, not with John Dickinson, but with another man. May Tobin had no rooms left that night, so she turned Eula and the mysterious man away. Within an hour, Eula was dead. In the first few days after the murders of Susan Hancock and Eula Phillips, police arrested more than a dozen men. But ultimately, it was the women's own husbands who were tried for the crimes. Suspicion quickly fell on Moses Hancock, who had a reputation for frequently being drunk and abusive. His case was initially dismissed, but the authorities would set their sights on him again later on. We'll get to that in a bit. James Phillips Jr. was arrested for Eula's murder on January 2, 1886, just eight days after his wife was killed and he himself was attacked. James was still weak and recovering from his injuries when his trial began in May, but he took the stand and even dipped his feet in ink and carried a 170-pound man across the courtroom to demonstrate that the bloody footprints discovered in his family's home could not have been his. The footprints of whoever had carried his wife out of the house and into the yard were significantly smaller than his own. However, witnesses testified about how much James and his wife had fought, and testified that they had heard him threaten her in the past. And a doctor who was called to the stand stated that James's wounds could have been self-inflicted. This was enough for the jury to convict James Phillips of second-degree murder. He received a seven-year sentence, but less than a year later, a court of appeals overturned his conviction. It stated its reasoning as follows, quote, First, the court erred in permitting the state to prove the unchastity of the defendant's wife as a motive for the killing, without having to show that this unchastity was brought to defendant's knowledge. Second, that the court erred in permitting the state to prove conditional and insignificant threats made by the defendant, which under the circumstances when they were made, showed no intention of the defendants carrying them out, end quote. James went on to remarry and have four more children. He moved to Georgetown and lived out the rest of his life there, working as a carpenter, a farmer, and a music teacher. Now, back to Moses Hancock. After James Phillips's conviction, but before its repeal, the authorities felt confident that they could secure a conviction for Mr. Hancock as well. During his trial, witnesses testified that he was often drunk, that he had abused his wife Susan, and that he had more than once threatened to end Susan's life. One of his daughters stated that Susan had said she wanted to leave Moses because she thought he was going to kill her. After Susan's death, a family member found a letter she had written to Moses but apparently never given to him. 
In it, she said that she would be going back to Waco, where the Hancocks had previously lived and where Susan's twin sister and her family still lived. Susan stated that despite her desire to live apart from Moses, she would answer every letter she received from him and be his wife, quote unquote, until death. Only three members of the jury were convinced that Moses truly had the motive to kill his wife that Christmas Eve. Eight jurors were in favor of acquittal, and one juror was on the fence. The case was dismissed. One year, eight murders so similar in nature that it seemed impossible for them to not be related. Seemingly countless suspects and arrests. And yet, to this day, no answers as to the identity of the killer. One additional name that came up during the trial of Moses Hancock was that of Nathan Elgin, or perhaps that should be pronounced Elgin, the same way the city outside of Austin is pronounced, I'm not sure. Nathan was a young man whom police shot and killed in early 1886 after he attacked a woman and dragged her into an alley. He was the child of former slaves who had settled in the Wheatsville area of Austin. Having grown up in Austin, he was obviously very familiar with the layout of the city. Based on how easily the servant girl annihilator was able to flee from each crime scene and slip away into the night, it does seem plausible that the killer was someone who'd lived in Austin for a long time and knew all of its ins and outs, making for quick and undetected escapes. In the Hancock trial, Sheriff Malcolm Hornsby pointed out that the murders stopped after Nathan's death, although he also remarked that the end of the crimes coincided with the arrest of Oliver Townsend for an unrelated crime. There was one very interesting detail about Nathan. He was missing a pinky toe, just like the footprint found at the scene of the attack on Rebecca and Mary Ramey. Then there's the theory about Maurice, the Malaysian cook. Maurice was employed at the Pearl House in 1885. The Pearl House, located at Congress Avenue and Cypress, or 3rd Street, was quite close to most of the murder locations. Maurice left town in 1886, shortly after the series of murders ended in Austin. The crimes of Jack the Ripper began in London not long after, in 1888. And then, not long after the crimes of Jack the Ripper ended, similar murders occurred in Jamaica, Nicaragua, and Tunisia. These were all places cargo ships traveled to, and Maurice the Cook was known to have worked on cargo ships. Could Maurice have been the Austin killer and gone on to commit other violent offenses around the world? We'll never know, but anything is possible. Well over 100 years after the crimes of the Servant Girl Annihilator rocked Austin, we can still only speculate on who committed them and why. May all of the victims rest in peace. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, y'all.